Hello and welcome to Fire in the Valley. Today we have myself, Mighty Pete, and we're joined by Brita McKay. Good morning or good afternoon, I should say. I've lost track of time already. Hello, Pete, and I am joining you all from the beautiful region of the Bahamas. <laughs> Not... <laughs> oh, yes. I, I wish. I'm in modern today and delighted to be with you, Pete, on your podcast. Thank you. Listen, it's, it's awesome to be on. So yeah, Brita is uh, currently sporting the backdrop of Hawaii in uh, from all the way from Monaghan, you know, so uh, it's great. It's, it's all about visualization, right? Yeah, absolutely. The joys of Zoom, folks. <laughs> Spice it up. <laughs> oh, I love it. So tell people, who are you? Where do you come from? And what do you do? Oh, I am Brita McCake. I live in Monaghan. I work in Dublin. I co-founded and I co-chair Lean in Ireland, which is an organization that was founded by Sheryl Sandberg. And what we do is we empower women to help them to achieve their ambitions. And I work in corporates, so I do a lot of project management. So I'm a massive woman for organizing things. I have three kids, three boys. They are 13, 10 and six. And I play music. So I play in a rock band that does fundraising gigs and I play in a trad band when I'm allowed to play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so and, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you Pete about fire in the belly because I think my journey and my life story probably has a lot of fire in the belly along the way and I love storytelling and I think we all learn so well from storytelling so I'm going to open I suppose the gateway to my past um, with you lot today to see if there's some nuggets in there that others can learn from. Well let's let's get straight into it then what, what does fire in the belly mean to you? So for me, I think it's something that many people don't think a lot about until they lose it. Um, and that's why when you contacted me and I seen fire in the belly, I was like, I want to do that. Absolutely. Because I'm someone who had fire in the belly when I was young, someone then who lost it for a while in the middle of her life and has now regained it. And I just want to share all of the stuff that I've learned with everybody that's listening today or watching today because I don't think we realize how important fire in your belly and your passion and what drives you is. And if we're not careful, we can lose it slowly and surely. So I want to, I suppose, raise awareness for people around all of that today. And you were saying, you know, it's, it's something that's come and gone and, and you know, it's, it's, and it's come back for you again, you know, but is it something, do you have fire in the valley today? Is it something you-, you Yeah, know? fire. <laughs> I have a volcano going on in here. <laughs> um, I'd say, so I'll tell you, from, from the very young age of, I'd say, five or six year old, I would say I was a fiery thing and a feisty little person back then. Um, and, and my childhood was, I was reared on a farm, a poultry farm in Monaghan. Um, so I was working and going to school a lot. And I think I learned hard work ethic from my dad, on that farm he used to get me to do his vat books and do his farm with my brothers and sisters so i think i learned a lot of kind of the drive from him so that's certainly something i would say that i picked up then um and then as i became sort of a little bit older and into my teens i started to play music um and i i have kids obviously and i often am um, doing little podcasts and articles on parenting because i don't want us to be parenting anymore the way we were parented because what people don't realize i think is that if you're parenting by default then you're parenting the way you were parented and i'm 44 so that would mean that i'd be parenting by a parenting standard that i got 40 years ago from people who picked it up probably 40 years before that and i don't think that is up to scratch for our kids anymore because they live in a very different world to what my world was like when i was a kid so I guess, you know, for, and that's why it's important for me to do the, the fire in the belly piece. I'm trying to make sure my kids also have passion and, and drive in them as well, same as I picked up. But competitions is something I did a lot as a kid. So I played music. I played in all of the flas. When I was 12 year old, I was playing on the All-Ireland Fla Kjol. And I did that every year to the age of 18. I was doing community games. I was doing gymnastics, swimming and running. And I know for a fact that being absolutely injected some of the fire in the belly for me. And I can tell and I can guarantee you that it has carried me in corporate worlds as well. So learning competition at a young age is very important. So if there's parents listening today or guardians, 
think about that because I know f- for me anyway, the competition that I was in when I was younger, not, not that I was driven to win all the time, but to, to get the feeling of being in competition and being ambitious and wanting to do well actually becomes who you are. Were you doing that competition for you or for, for someone else? I was doing it because I liked it. And I was starting to make friends through music hmm. and friends through all of the gymnastics, swimming. I enjoyed it. And I do think I probably learned how to be competitive and learned how to be ambitious at that young age, doing those competitions, like it's, it's quite, it's something that happened almost accidentally. But I just think for adults, it's an important thing to have. You, you, you need to be driven so that you can do well in life and that you know what you're worth and you know your value because all of that is intertwined. Uh, how does your parenting style or how has your parenting style changed from the parenting style that you, you came through? I would say my kids <laughs> would describe me as a coach nearly rather than a mum. And because I have done self mastery over the last sort of circa 10 years of myself, and I now am an emotional intelligent accredited coach and now coach women and men all over the world on career plus life, I, I naturally have evolved as a parent because now my parenting with my kids is very much in tune with how they feel and helping them to understand their feelings. None of it goes in the bin, none of it's put under the carpet. Um, And that's not something that was happening 40 years ago. So I think it's very important now to listen to kids. Kids are very smart and they are so intuitive. And I'm not sure we recognize that in default parenting, but absolutely with conscious parenting, you realize that and you help them walk through their emotions. You're giving them skills that they won't have to learn you know, some difficult way when they're older. You've thrown in a a word or a term there, conscious parenting. Can you unwrap that for us? Yeah, I suppose it's the opposite to what I call default parenting. So if, if you are not aware of your own emotions and how emotions work and how your subconscious mind works and how your drivers actually inform your decisions and impact everything you do, then you, you won't be able to teach your kids that. And that's something I didn't know for years. And unfortunately, it took a spell in my life where the fire in my belly was nearly extinguished down to an ember, I would say, um, which was a, a difficult time. But it was absolutely something that forced me to go and understand emotions, subconscious thinking and conscious thinking. And then, then what happens after that is when you understand your own you get it for kids as well. And then you start teaching kids how to do that. And kids end up being little um, mastery kids. They understand emotion so well. They understand why they're upset if there's been a row between them because they're siblings. Um, it's very, very different to regular parenting, I would say. And just as, a, as an overview, where, where you're at now, I mean, how does sort of almost pre-event and post-event, because you talked about, you know, losing, you know, losing or, or your fire in the belly going down to that ember. I mean, how do you see yourself in terms of before that and, and, and now? Yeah, in terms of who question. you are as a person. Um, and I would say if like the way I think of it, Pete, is that every child that's born has a spark. They all have talent. They all have skills and they all have as much potential as you can imagine. And then what can happen in life is you can run into difficult areas in your life that start to take away maybe self-esteem, perhaps self-confidence, uh, self-worth and, and value. And those are seriously damaging things. So I would say every child this day is born with a spark. They are put on this earth with special t- talents and skills. And that's what they're supposed to be here to do, to contribute to the world. And I just think it's seriously important that we are all thinking about the fire that we keep it alive, that we never let anybody try to put it out on us. Um, I'll give you an example of when I was in my late teens, I joined a show band and I ended up in a show band called The Outlaws, for those who might have heard them years ago. So I was actually um, on the road every weekend. So I was at college during the week and then I was on the road at the weekends playing to put myself through college. And then I joined the Reserve Defence Forces in Monaghan. Um, And I had no idea of anything to do with military life. I had no military family. 
Um, but my friend rang me up one day and said, Breda, we're going to this new thing. And it's the first time they've let girls into it. So will you come? And I just said, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what people do when they have fire in their belly, right? You'll say yes to things. You won't be cowering out of things. You'll be brave and you'll want to embrace something that's fun or that there's energy in or there's learnings in for you. Um, and I did that. Um, and we were the first girls in to the Reserve Defence Forces. And I stayed in it for 20 years. I absolutely loved it. Um, and I ended up being their first female lieutenant in the unit that I was in. Um, it done an awful lot for me because, as I mentioned earlier, I do lean in Ireland here. Um, but the reason I ended up understanding diversity and the importance of unconscious bias is because of those days when I joined that reserve army. Um, and if you imagine like five young girls into this um, army barracks of older men that had had nothing but men around them working with them for their entire lifetime. Um, so it was very difficult for them with these, you know, five young girls that didn't know how to handle us, how to address us, what to do with us. Um, and it was a massive learning for them and for us. Um, but I would absolutely say that the drive in me and the fire in my belly made me want to get good at that. And again, we talked about competition. And absolutely, when I got in there and found that we were the only girls in it, I thought that is a sense of unfairness about that. Women should have been allowed to do this. I loved it. I was firing all the mortars, all of the grenades, all of the rifles, the submachine guns, a lot, and I loved it. So that's where I learned about unconscious bias and unfortunately experienced some of it. And then that's what made me decide to be the change that I wanted to see, which is one of my favorite quotes. And I often teach people that now when I'm coaching them. So be the change you want to see. It's a very simple one, but by God, did it hit me like a, a thunderbolt years ago. So um, I decided I was going to try and, and show the men that the women could do the army and, and the women that they should stay in it and take part in it and learn and get all of the skills that they could from it. So that then led me to a place in my corporate career where I was running female led networks. Um, and I was empowering women and I had women coaching women and I had men and women uh, mentoring each other um, and trying to help women get a sense of um, career and success and to drive themselves because women do good things when they get money. They usually give it back to the communities and they usually give it back to their families. Um, and yet so many of them end up working part time or dropping out of the work life because it gets too difficult. And, and I think it's us that's wrong in society, not them. So I'm trying to do my bit, I suppose, to drive those women, help the guys get involved in driving those women and their careers so that we get diversity of thought at the higher echelons in all our organizations. And, and without a fire in the belly, I wouldn't have been doing any of that, which is the big point here. I mean, if you have drive and you have ambition and you've got a taste of competition, you can do things like that. Where, where does a drive come from? I think, so I do a lot of vision boards these days. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you have heard of vision boards or done any. But in this room, I'm, I'm actually not in uh, the Bahamas. I'm actually in Monaghan. And, <laughs> and other than the green screen, what I have up on the wall here is vision boards. Um, and I'm big into creating visions with people, right? Because what I can tell you is if you know what it is you want out of life and you're very clear about how that looks and you think in ink, so you've got it written down or you've got it drawn out and your mind can see those pictures and can see those graphics. What you're doing there is you're giving it instructions. You're saying, this is the life I would love. If I had a magic wand, this is the life I would design for me. And what that does, it allows you to play to your strengths, your skills, the, the very talents that you were put on the earth to use. So if you have a vision that's that strong and that crisp, and you get emotionally engaged with it, what will happen is drive will happen automatically for you. And you'll be pulled through the life difficulties that we will all encounter, no doubt. And you will keep going because you've had a taste, a vision of what it is that you want to make out of your life. What a legacy you're going to leave. And legacy is a whopper of a word. 
<laughs> a lot of people do be like, oh my God, nobody's ever asked me that before. But what is your legacy? It's about high time we ask ourselves that, I think, because you're creating it, whatever it is. So either you create it based on what society just fills you with, or you create it based on what you know you want to leave as a legacy. And, and that involves your skills and your talents and your attributes. So vision will pull and will drive you and will give you ambition and will give you all the appetite you need. But without vision, I do think people end up faltering a little bit and they coast. I do tell a lot of people I'm coaching about coasting. If you haven't got plans laid out for yourself and a vision, then you are most likely coasting. Is there a, is there a time and a place to coast or is it... They say in Lean In that there are times when you lean out, which is the same thing. So when you are in places, different elements of your life and different sort of paragraphs of your chapters, there are times when you know you need to take time out. And that's when we lean out or, or you choose to take your foot off the gas a little bit and you give yourself a bit of space to think about what it is strategically you want to do. And that's a very important piece. Um, and then when you do get over that piece and you've got it all sort of figure out again and you feel ready to go again, that's when you go again, your drive and that fire in the belly, just that'll drive you. You mentioned legacy there. Talk, talk to us about that, what it means to you and what it looks like. So legacy is something you don't hear talked about that much. And I think that's a shame because if we're not all trying to get to a legacy, that is a really whopper of a legacy, then what are we doing? You know, we're just being average. We're just doing what everybody else is doing around us. And what that is, is average. And average is easy. You don't have to make any effort to be average. You do have to make a lot of effort to be awesome. And you won't get a legacy worth talking about unless you're awesome. And I just, I think some years ago when I was trying to do, I did a lot of self-mastery. I actually spent a lot of time reading articles on social media. And that's where I taught myself most of the elements of emotional intelligence, which is a strange thing to say because so many people are given out with social media. But for me, social media was where I learned an awful lot of the basics around emotional intelligence. And remember folks, we aren't learning this stuff in school in big detail. And I, I find most people are learning it the hard way. So the way to they run into an emotional wall somewhere in their life, and it does happen because change, we are sure it happens. <laughs> the growth bit is the optional bit. But um, I certainly would have learned it because I had to back to the wall, use my social media and all of those elements. There's so many elements in the pot for me that I've had to learn. But this knowledge is power. And in the mix there somewhere, I figured out what a legacy is. And I figured out that I hadn't got one. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh my God, I have been coasting and I, nobody had ever mentioned legacy to me before. So I do that a lot now with people that I coach and talks that I give and stuff. But um, a legacy for me, right? What I don't want is them just to say um, she was a good mom and she had a good job um, and she was an important part of the community, right? I don't want that. I want, she made a difference in people's lives. She improved people's lives. She, she reared three boys who are absolute firecrackers like their mum. Whatever it was I achieved around all of the women coaching and the empowerment of women, that is what I want for a legacy. Wow, that's, it's, it's powerful in itself. Can you break down as well for some terms, you talk about emotional intelligence and anyone that's maybe not that, that sort of averse with the term, can you, can you unpack that for us a bit? Yeah, and you know what? 10 years ago, I didn't know what it was either. So I think that's the bizarre bit and that's the sad bit for me that we, we leave school, we go through college, you know, we usually settle down or not. And yet nowhere along that journey does anybody actually teach us about how important your emotions are and how they are driven by a subconscious mind that you've been conditioned with and that you've got a whole suite of self-beliefs going on in there and you've got two and a half thousand thoughts an hour and, and most of it's negative because naturally that's the way society has provided you. You switch on the newspapers today. I actually put on the radio today and I switched it off because all I was listening to was COVID 
COVID, COVID. And it was a really good discussion. But did it make me feel driven, ambitious, or positive for today? No, it didn't. So I decided, what am I listening to this for? <laughs> I know COVID's here. I know what to do within my controllables. I know what to do. I don't need to listen to this stuff. So I switched it off. But if you don't know to do that, then you will absorb all of that negativity that's going on. You open any newspaper and it's not just when COVID landed, it's any time. Newspapers, they do headlines. We love bad news because negativity bias here that we once needed when we were in a cave because our fear kept us alive. But Pete, you may look like you're in a cave. <laughs> I may look like I'm in a cave, but we're not in caves anymore and we, we're not going to get eaten. So fear is a whopper of an emotion. And I had to understand, I had to unpick from myself the different types of fear. And then I had to learn how to spot them in the decisions that I was making for myself. Then I had to understand what a subconscious mind is, how it has got programmed. And then I started to learn about my conscious mind and how the two work together. Um, and then of course I found the value of uh, emotions being triggered which is how you start to claw back and trace back what's going on in the subconscious mind. And when you get back there and you start to understand what has gone in there from your conditioning, then you can start to reprogram it and you can start to get better quality, healthier beliefs and thoughts going in there, which then influence your conscious decisions, the day to day stuff that you do. And therefore, you get more control of your emotions. Can I ask if, if you know, uh, just well, what are some of the key things you've had to unpack in your life? And you talked about, you know, fear being a big one there maybe. And, you know, but I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what, what are the key things you've sort of unpacked through the years? I would say, and, and a lot of people say to me, I, I hear you, Brita, and you're doing something right because you're obviously flourishing, but how do you do it? I think many of them are just at a loss for where to start with this stuff. And I would say I started with, um, listening to the likes of Tony Robbins, um, Marissa Pierce, Mel Robbins. And, and that's something I often throw out to people to go and Google those guys and girls and start listening to their material to see, does it start to ring any bells for you? But without a shadow of a doubt, for those who I have coached and certainly for myself, where I start to get the wheel to turn for people is with your inner voice. So that's kind of the first place I bring people. And what I usually do, Pete, is I usually say to them, imagine I've just given you a sensor and you have to pop it on here onto your forehead and it's going to try and help you catch every negative thought that you have. Because until you consciously start doing that, then what you're doing is you're doing negative thinking and known to yourself. You don't know you're doing it. And the more you do that, the more you're helping to program the negativity bias in the back office. So the inner voice for me and for everybody that I'd be coaching is definitely the first place they start to feel massive change. <laughs> it's amazing actually, because um, I'm doing another podcast um, with a comedian in Dublin and he was asking me about my inner voice, right? And I, I had said to him, you don't realize how many of them you're doing. <laughs> Within the space of about five minutes, he had done three of them out loud. He'd been given out to himself verbally. And I said, you just did that. And he was like, oh my God, she's right. <laughs> so unfortunately for most of us, we don't know we're doing it. And until you start to listen to what your inner voice is doing, then you can't change it. And you won't know what it's doing. And therefore, you're not in control of the impact it's having. So without a shadow of a doubt, the inner voice. And my kid, my six-year-old boy, Kyle, calls it the inside voice, <laughs> which is another good one for kids or for adults. If you're not sure what the inner voice is, because at the start of my journey, I probably wouldn't have known either. So he calls it the inside voice. It's when you're talking to yourself. For you, is that, is that your voice? Is that you or is that somebody else in your life? And is it just one or do you have multiple voices? I would say we all have multiple voices. I would say we talk to ourselves very negatively. And when I start people on this journey, and when I started mine, I'd, I'd heard, it, you know, on some of the articles that I'd been reading about how critical we are on ourselves. But I used to be, what I thought, very confident. 
Um, and I used to think, I'm not that bad. Oh dear God, I was desperate. When I started analyzing the way I spoke to myself, I was disgusted. I'd never spoke to you or any other human like that. Um, and it takes that stark realization to, for, for people to stop and say, oh my God, I can't believe I've actually been doing that to myself. Because what that does, it runs down your self-esteem. You keep doubting yourself. You're creating self-limiting beliefs as you go. It is deadly dangerous. And the good news is that when people start tuning into that and catching them, what I do with them is I tell them every negative self-talk that you've done. So every time you've said the likes off, oh my God, look at what a mess I've made of that. Or sure, I knew that wouldn't work. Why did I try it? Or whatever it is that people are saying to themselves, you know, the inbox bin, Pete, you know, the little bin that sits in your inbox. What I do with them is every time they get a negative thought like that and they're talking to themselves and they've caught it, they have to put it in one of those bins. You have one of those in your mind, you put the lid firmly on it and you replace it with three positive thoughts. Because we're, we have so much negativity going on that we need to drown ourselves in self-love and positivity for a while till we get it balanced up again. It, it's, it is amazing how much people do talk to themselves, you know, and depending on, you know, he says, how, how's the voices in your head? Everyone gets offended and going, I'm, you know, I'm not psychotic. It's like, well, do you have an inner critic? Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's funny how we, we don't necessarily, we accept it as being there because it's always been there, right? I just think we get used to it. Yeah. That I think people, they don't notice it because you're doing it from you were born. And, and some of the voices that you've absorbed are those that were rearing you or were around you when you were a kid. And you've all of that going on, that dialogue's going on, ding dust, and you don't even know it. So, I mean, it's about reprogramming your thoughts so that they can be more positive to serve you. Because otherwise, all they'll do is damage you. If you let what society has put in there stay there and you let that continue to run, all you're going to do is you're going to put self-limiting beliefs in place for yourself. You're going to find reasons not to do things. You're going to come up with excuses all the time and you're going to be driven by fear and you won't even know it. That is absolutely what I was doing before I started self-mastery on myself. And now it's as clear as day to me and I can see everything so crystal clear now. All of the confusion is gone. I am very solid in terms of my emotions and my regulation of emotions. My decision making is now driven um, by information and it's very conscious compared to what it would have been years ago. I'm interested, your, your language switches between visual and kinesthetic a lot and I'm, I can't place it because I was, I was thinking there more, you were a lot more visual when you talked about the eye and, and more kinesthetic when you talk about the you. Does that make any sense? Is there? I don't know. I think I mix it up for people because there's a lot of my story that I'm trying to help people, I suppose, to find their story from. But at the same time, I don't want anybody to, to feel like they are any different to everybody else because I can tell you a fact is unless you were blessed and reared by people who had already done mastery on themselves and they were already automatically thinking positively all the time, then the good chance is that you have picked up negative thinking and you've got a negative subconscious. I have yet to meet someone who hasn't. And that'll tell you because I am a devil for talking to everybody and anybody and I love networking and everybody I meet has either had to go through something really tough in their life and had to then teach themselves about emotional intelligence and subconscious thinking and understand how their decision making has been going or they haven't and they're still coasting and they're still running into walls and it's needless it's pointless you can actually turn that wheel through knowledge to say knowledge is power oh my god they are so right <laughs> i have learned that but to your question, I suppose I do a lot of I and we because I want everybody to understand that it's not, I think some people feel like everybody else has it better. And, and you hear lots of that happening on Instagram where we've young people, you know, wanting to be what they look like on Instagram and idealizing sort of models and everybody else is prettier and all of that. And that isn't the case at all because again, I have yet to meet someone who doesn't doubt themselves and doesn't 
you know, compare themselves to others unless they've done mastery. So every one of us is the same. I, I said to a woman one day, unless we have treated ourselves, then we are not in a place where we are making good decisions, nor are we having the best impact on the people around us or in the world around us. You have to do this work. And it doesn't do itself, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm. Are you where you're supposed to be? I think so. Yeah, mm. I, I'm very driven, uh, particularly around motivating people. So before COVID, I had been doing an awful lot of motivational talks. So I was in and out of a lot of corporates and industry groups. Um, a lot of the big insurances coming together. I did a lot of diversity launches as well, different diversity programs. But I, I did loads of just raw, pure, authentic mastery talks. And the impact they had on men and women was amazing. Oh, my God. I mean, it was astonishing. But I know it was astonishing because it was astonishing to me, too. They call it an awakening and they're not wrong. Because <laughs> when you start to understand how psychology works, how your mind works, and you then can understand how others work and you can then help them. So that's totally astonishing. That is magic at its best. That's people magic at its best. And for me, there is nothing more rewarding. So, you know, that's why I do so much on my social media. I've done an awful lot of videos this year that I didn't have time to do pre-COVID, but I haven't got a four and a half hour commute every day at the moment. Some days I do, but not every day. So I decided to maximize the bit of time I was getting back to do what it is that I am passionate about. What's the fire in my belly? And without a shadow of a doubt, it's a raging fire, I can tell you that. And it's one where I want to change the world. Plus, I want to show others how to go from average to informing themselves and going for awesome. Because if we think about it, if we are all average and we're not playing to our strengths, we all lose out. It doesn't add up. So by, by dimming your light, you're not doing anybody any favors. Yet, if we were all taught to aim for an abundant lifestyle, abundance in our career, that we deserve the best, which some people still don't think to do. When I'm coaching people, many the one has said to me, oh, why would I deserve the best? Why would you not? Okay, so again, that's conditioning at play. So my passion, and my mission in this world is to try and get people from the young age right up to whenever it is they need it to help them, to teach them and leave them that they can understand how the subconscious is working, how their conditioning has happened, how they can fix it and then give them big goals, help them to build big visions and big legacy ambitions at that because then people will be pushed out of their comfort zone They'll be learning new things. They'll be growing and, and life will be amazing for them. We'll have more legacies amongst us and everybody will win. What do you deserve? The best in life. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I, I deserve to, I suppose, bust the dreams I have for my legacy. And, and what, I, what my kids deserve is a mum who can do that and has taught others to do that. And that has taught them to do that so that they can do that for others as well. Because people magic and people transformation is no small feat. And it's, it's not your average job. But, but changing lives is everything to me. And I just think there's so many people now starting to coach because there's such a need for it. Because this isn't regular education. Like nobody taught me anywhere that I was. Um, so yeah, that's my dream, my legacy, and I'm not going to stop until I get there. <laughs> that fire has got fire lighters in it, Pete. <laughs> and people then say, when you've got a good enough, strong enough vision that you're unstoppable. And you know what? They are right. Because so many things happen in every one of our lives, but yet nothing has stopped me. And everything has tried but nothing has actually stopped me. So I just think the power of your drive, the power of that fire in the belly, don't underestimate it mm. and, and pay it attention because if you are not living with fire in your belly, then you're not living at all. And the only time that that spark should go out is when we are gone from this earth. So if you are alive today and you don't feel like you've got a fire in your belly, 
you need to do something about that rapidly. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. You said an interesting comment then saying nobody taught you. Can you unwrap that for us? Yeah, well, I think if any of us just think back to school, to college, like whereabouts did anybody sit you down and teach you how your conditioning is impacting your thinking or, or even help you understand how you make decisions or even help you understand how the impact of your decisions or your behaviours, how that manifests on others. I mean, nowhere in my life did that happen. So I'm finding people all of the time coming to me looking for help because they're hitting emotional walls with no toolkit. So we've no go-to for emotions because it's not mainstream education. So they taught me history and geography, but they didn't teach me how to manage emotional sort of issues in my life or how, how to even understand it all. Um, and, and that's not a criticism of anybody. That's just how it is. But yet the difference in people who have mastered their emotions and understand their conscious and their subconscious mind, there's night and day. And their outcomes are totally different to what they wear. Their belief in what they deserve is totally different to what they wear. So nobody's going to teach you in mainstream. This is stuff you've got to go looking for. And, and we talked there earlier about the radio, and the newspaper and all the negativity. You can get any amount of that. It's there for you. If you want it, wallow, put on the radio, open the newspaper, do whatever you want to do. And all you're going to get is more negativity going in there. So you're going to absorb more. And I can tell you, there's already enough in there. So to teach somebody some of the mastery pieces that I mentioned already, they've got to want to go looking for it. You've got to seek it out. Um, and a lot of people ask me, where did you start? And what I did, I did desperation because I didn't know where to turn, but I knew I didn't have the knowledge to help myself. So I decided, well, somebody in the world has the knowledge and I'm going to go and find it. Um, and I love, I mentioned social media to you earlier. A lot of people diss social media. There are a lot of downsides to it. But if you're using it right, then your feed should teach you all of these things. So when I'm doing motivational talks, I do threaten everybody in the audience that I'm going to do a deep dive <laughs> on their social media feeds and I'm going to get them to show me what they're following and they're all like oh no she's coming but seriously though your your social media can be the greatest source of inspiration and knowledge if you will use it right you have google folks in your pockets in your handbag in your back pocket and what are you doing you're looking at dogs and dinners right and yet all of that information is sitting there for you. And your parents didn't have that, but you do. So, I mean, it's there for the take and Pete, and it drives me dotty that people will sit and they will scroll about COVID and they will fight on social media over COVID. And I'm looking at them going, good God, have you any idea what you're doing to yourself? Your negativity bias is lapping this up. So you start to feel that everything's awful in the world. They start to fight with each other then over this. Um, and yet, one of your five people or one of the five mindsets that, that you are spending time with is your social media. Um, and I'm sure you know, Pete, like you're usually the average of the five people that you spend headspace with. And I do teach a lot of people with that too. And they're like, what do you mean, Brita? So think about who it is you actually have conversations with. What are you listening to? Are you listening to Pete's podcast? Or are you listening to some of the news stations that's telling you who's dead and how many's dead and how awful it is? Because now that we are all online so much, without a shadow of a doubt, our social media feed is definitely one of those five people that we are spending headspace with. So even if you were really smart and you were choosing very carefully the people that you wanted to have conversations with, that were, you were allowing your subconscious to be exposed to, you're still not doing it right if your social media is full of news because it'll do the damage on you. And I have talked to so many people who have come off their phone and they've just scrolled and they've just scrolled <laughs> and they're just throwing their eyes to heaven and they think it's desperate and I'm going, stop doing that. Nobody is making you do that. Your subconscious mind likes negativity because it's familiar and humans love familiar. 
So when you see bad news, you're drawn to it because it's familiar. What's not familiar is positivity. Um, and when I'm coaching a lot of people, I make them say positive statements about themselves, which freaks them out. <laughs> I made a guy say, I am unapologetically awesome <laughs> about two weeks ago. And he was like, I can't say that, Brina. <laughs> But, and I was explaining to him, the reason that you're struggling with that is because your mind doesn't see that as familiar. You don't usually tell yourself that. And I asked him, did you ever tell yourself that? And he went, no, right? But we don't know these things, right? We're just plumped out into the world. Nobody tells us these things. And we go around buying newspapers and we talk to each other how better desperate it is. All we're doing is damage. We didn't know it. Are you pain or pleasure driven? Hmm. <laughs> I've never been asked that before, Pete. <laughs> I would say pleasure because if somebody suggests something to me that I think there might be an ounce of fun in for me, I say yes. So if so I think I I now believe I deserve the best and I now believe I am a very valuable. Um, and worthy person. I didn't always believe that, but with all the work I've done in myself, absolutely. And I now believe I deserve goodness and happiness and fun in abundance. Um, so absolutely, I, I think now, if you'd asked me that years ago, I may not have said pleasure, you know that, because I don't think I felt I deserved it. But that was all down to my conditioning. But because I've done all of the rework on myself, and I would say it was a rebuild that I did on myself, um, I absolutely deserve pleasure and want more of it in my life. When you talk about that rebuild and that turning point, where, where is that in your timeline? I would say it started about 10 years ago. And I would say it's, I, w I would be afraid to say it's over because I always want to learn. And I think when you're starting to learn about your motivations, your drives, you're starting to understand your self-belief suites, your subconscious, your conscious mind. I mean, that will keep me going, I'd say, for the rest of my days. But I would say I have learned the most of it. So now I'm just learning for fun, almost. Um, and I'm now learning for to, to keep my curiosity fed, to see is there anything out there that I haven't encountered before yet? And is that something that, that would help me learn more? So, I, but I, like 10 years is a long time to be at that. And I would say about... It took me six to seven years to really master it all. But now I did that on my own. So like for people listening today or watching, you can do that a lot faster with a coach. I guess I was so much in the dark about emotional intelligence that I didn't actually want to get a coach because I didn't know how I would even explain to a coach where I was at. So I did it probably the slow way um, and the difficult way. But at the same time, it absolutely worked. And when you have gone through pain and you've had to rebuild yourself by yourself, like that's a whole different version of me than what I had before. So for anybody thinking of trying this, I would say get a coach to get you started and to give you some guidelines and give you some basics in this stuff um, and then see where you go from there. Because like I did it on my own, but as I say, I don't want people going through this as slowly as I did. Because life is short, folks, you know, um, and I had to spend seven years of my life learning. Now, the good thing is that everybody else will benefit from what I've gone through because now I now know it so well um, and I know it in my sleep that I'm now very passionate about helping others. So so mine isn't a waste and I'm sure others won't be either, you know, and, and yourself, Pete, and the likes of everybody trying to do podcasts and encourage wellness and positivity. All of us have been through something that has, has made us sit up and, and take in new information and teach ourselves a bit so that we could get a grip on it. So not everybody loses, I suppose, you know, people benefit from others who have learned. It's an interesting concept. I mean, I'm do, you, do you need to see the dark to see the light, you know, the, and that, in that contrast, because you, you know, does it force you through a certain path? I do think it does. I think that until you've been in a situation where your back is to the wall, then you won't be open enough 
to the likes of self-mastery or emotional intelligence because you will wonder why would i need that so you know it, it could be a good thing because if you've ended up in a place in your life that was super difficult you've had to look at things differently like i coach so many people who are back to the wall and they're desperate and they don't know where to turn they're like me seven like ten years ago before i started mine um and, and certainly I think because they found themselves in such dark place, they are open to learning. They are literally doing every task and action and practice that I'm giving them and they flourish. And I do be sitting like just applauding them because I now know that I can transform somebody rapidly. Like I can do that now in seven weeks for someone. And yet I went through seven years. <laughs> slowly you know trying to teach myself on the quiet um and yet like i can do that now so you know what it is a benefit but yes i would say if if you'd have came to me seven years ago ten years ago and said breed i want to teach you about emotional intelligence i would have been wondering why are you teaching me this pete i don't need to know this my life is fine because my life would have been like everybody else's life and very average and i would have thought well should that's exactly the way it should be so I probably wouldn't have had enough pain at that time to make me want to listen or learn. So, and to be fair, everybody that I meet that is now in this business and are teaching others about positivity and growth, every one of them has been through something fairly awful. So I do think it takes quite a bit of dark for us to then, to, to even look for the light. And, and then you're damn glad to see it and you're very open to learning and you do exactly what you're told and you get results. So, you know, it's, it's just amazing. Like, and that's the fire in the belly. Absolutely. Talk to us about mini Brida. What were you like as a, as a young person? Oh God. So I'd say I, I remember primary school. I was quite timid. Would you believe that? Like I was quite shy. Um, I remember being bullied a little bit. Um, and then the music piece started to bring me out of myself and all of the sports. And, and I don't think we can underestimate the social benefits of that for kids. And that's why my kids are now at kickboxing, hip hop, swimming and, and buckets of things. Because A, I want to, to see, can I get some of that competition into them? Not the winning bit, but the wanting to do better and wanting to put in an effort and that hard work ethic, um, plus the social skills. So yeah, quiet little girl, I'd say, done what I was told, and then started music, started to do sports, started to mix, do groups, competitions. And then by the time I was 12, 13, I definitely was a lot probably more confident because of the music, and I was playing on stages and playing in competitions and all sorts. And then I joined Froga, um, and again, I met lots of people my age, and then I started to do disco dancing, as it was called back then. <laughs> I am so old. Um, um, so that probably helped me bring myself out of myself as well. And then definitely the show band, absolutely, plonked on a stage, driven around the country every weekend. And I was taught how to perform on a stage within the show band by men that had been doing it for years. So the professionals took me in hand and absolutely helped me to learn performing on stage. And I loved it. <laughs> absolutely loved it. And then the, the FCA, the Reserve Defence Forces, another step up for me because they put me in front of groups of 100 people across a square. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a military barracks, but a military barracks is a massive, massive space. Um, and everybody's marched onto it. And they put me in front of 100 people. And I was in charge of them. I had to take them off the square. I had to march them here and there, give them all the instructions in Irish. Now, how would that not bring you out of yourself? You know, and, and I guess that's how you can see the public speaking has followed on from that because I absolutely mastered my fears because it, it and I suppose they didn't even come into it. It was just, they were telling me what I needed to do um, and I needed to take on platoons and, organize all their logistics and all of their training and do everything for them. So I had no choice <laughs> but go in front of groups of 100 people and get them all organized. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, I always tell people anything to do with the military, you should always try it because the skills I picked up there around organization, around public speaking, around coaching have stood to me ever since. And then when I got into corporates, I started to do project management because I was well used to organizing big groups of people, um, organizing events, organizing shooting days, organizing training. Um, and not everybody had those skills, but then not everybody had been volunteering. You know, so anything your kids or your teens or you as adults can get into, get into it. Because there's always skills to be got out of it, experiences, friends, moments to be got out of it. So um, the fire in the belly piece, I think, has resulted in me saying yes to an awful lot of things that I would say someone without as much fire wouldn't have said yes to because fear would have gotten their way. When you talk about fear, can you, I mean, I'm just trying to help people relate to, to what it is. I mean, what was, what did it look like or feel like for you, that fear piece, you know, and the people yeah. would recognize that, that you sort of burst through, if you like. Yeah. And fear is something that I became totally obsessed with when I started to teach myself mastery because I found it everywhere in all the decisions I was making. And I'll tell you something else, no matter who I sit down with now in career coaching, whether that's a man or a woman, or whether I'm doing life coaching, or whether I'm just having a conversation with someone, I can trace back their decisions and I can find fear traced along all of their decisions. And it just drives me nuts because we are instilled with all of this fear from we are kids. Right. And here's some of the types of fear. So you've got fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of being judged. Um, and, and then you've got the weird one, which is fear of success. So fear, I just think we don't realize how massive it is in all of us. And you, you think about it, right? When you were a kid, you were told, watch that. Don't get up on that. You're going to fall. Stop doing that. Blah, blah, right. So you've got that fear programmed into you bit by bit by bit by well-meaning people and i'm not saying stop doing that and let your kids go mad but what i am saying is to be aware that fear is in there now and fear keeps driving decisions on people the amount of people that i have to get and push them back in a door that have come out a door on me as in career coaching so many people have said oh no i'm not going for that job because of this this and this and i'm going to stop right there and i can trace them back i'm saying okay why are you afraid to do that, right? And I have to then help them identify where the decisions they're making are actually just fear-driven decisions. And all that's doing is damaging them because it's going to hold them back. Oh, it's frightening. When you start to see fear properly in your life and in your decisions, it's scary how much of an influence it's having on our minds. I would often describe it to people. Say like this part of your mind is full of ambition and ideas and creativity. It's got this blanket over the top of fear. So you could be a very creative person and very productive and full of ideas and full of feastiness or feistiness and drive and everything. But if you do not master the fears, they will keep you stuck and you will not use the skills or the drive or the ambition because God forbid that you would either fail or you'd be rejected or it would go well. <laughs> see the fear of what other people think good god i think it's driving most of society and i don't think we realize it talk to us about fear of success because that's triggered quite a strong uh reaction in you both times yeah so it's because it shocks me when i finally got my head around it and realized that every one of us are afraid to do something too well because what would people think and that is a massive one that many people do not realize they're doing. And some of them have heard of self-sabotage. And you only really start to understand that when you are doing well and you're starting to make progress on something. And for some reason, you'll decide to take it back a step or you'll decide to put it on ice for a while or you'll decide that maybe you should stick to something safer. And that's when the, the self-sabotage piece is coming in and that's the fear of success. And I honestly think that, that what's behind it is what will people think of me if I do this and if I become 
this person that's known for this or or even you know is so successful what would people think i see it pete in careers coaching so so much it's unreal i see people and and we are masters of delusion us human beings are lethal we can convince ourselves of anything <laughs> but certainly around careers and the self-sabotage we can come up with excuses to beat the band as to why we shouldn't do something like um like i could like easily i could so so come up with excuses like well i can't do this because i've got the kids to pick up or i've got to do this that and the other um and there's so many reasons that are so easy to pop in there and that takes away that fear just in case we do too well what would people think who does she think she is where does she think she came from all of that old conditioning is what's driving that fear and that self-sabotage stuff. It's, a, it's one that those doing very well in careers have to be very careful of because if you're not, it will undo all of your good work. So it's one that has to be mastered. You can master the fear of failure and you can master the fear of rejection and you can get to a point in your life where you're doing well, but you're still at risk of that fear of success and that self-sabotage and I have seen it over and over so it's one that I do a lot of the coaching with with people who I know are very driven are very ambitious are doing well and I want to keep them on that track or or with somebody that has been the person that has hit the ball and has done a transformation with a bit of guidance from me they they are at risk as well of self-sabotage then because Sometimes they get scared. I've created a totally different version of them with them. And that's weird because your family and friends aren't used to this new version that actually has boundaries and that has self-esteem and that knows their worth. So those people are the ones that I watch particularly for around the fear of success or the self-sabotage. Well, isn't, isn't it astounding how we can stand in our own way? It's just, it's mind-blowing in so many ways it's just sad because we have all of this potential and marissa Pierce, one of the things that she always says <clears throat> she's a fabulous person to listen to she's all over youtube if anybody wants to look her up but she'll always say when you were born as a baby you felt entitled to be fed if you wanted attention you asked for it and you got it and then look at us as adults sitting here talking about the fear of success like it's mental how how your environment and how your conditioning can do such damage and and yet you may be unaware of it for a long time but i mean the beauty i suppose of what we're doing today and all of the other material and content that's out there is there's a lot of stuff that is trying to help people these days to master all of that fear to understand their conditioning to undo it to rebuild um i just i just think there probably needs more conversation about it and more awareness um, because as you had said earlier, if you're not in a dark place, you don't really pass any remarks on it. And if you're not learning, then those around you aren't learning either. So everybody is at a disservice. It's almost the danger of being okay. So. Yeah, or average. So okay equals average. If, we, if we're doing what everybody else is doing and we're just getting by, then that must mean we're doing okay. Uh -uh. No, it doesn't. What age do you remember being when you were truly yourself as a young person? Um, I would say I was truly myself in my teens. I would say in primary school and secondary school, I was finding my feet. Um, and I think all teenagers are the same. They're very aware of how they look, who they hang around with. It's all peer pressure. And I would say it was really when I started the show band stuff. And when I started the army stuff that I felt truly in my zone um, because I was my authentic self and it went down a bomb, <laughs> pardon the pun. <laughs> but so I felt at home on a stage playing music, entertaining people, performing for them and watching them enjoy it. Um, and certainly in my army days, I felt very at home coaching people, helping them to get from basic knowledge to somebody who could actually work a weapon really well, you know, and shooting competitions and everything. So those were the two things that I absolutely loved late teens. 
And, and these days, like if you were asking me that question last year before COVID hit, I am at my best and in my happy place when I am on a stage teaching massive numbers of people about themselves. That is what I want to do for the rest of my life all around the world, because I see it no matter what country or jurisdiction, there is a need for some of that knowledge and that information to be passed on so that generations can improve and people can have better lives going forward and everybody can get to use their skills and attributes. I'm sick of watching people suffer. Do, do people get you? Yeah. <laughs> I'd say they think I'm stone mad half the time because I just say what I think now. But that's because I've mastered all of my fears. Mm. <laughs> and I think authentic and raw can be quite unusual these days because, mm. you know, there's so much gloss and social media is so perfect. And then I come on and I just tell it as it is. Um, and, and people seem to just love it because they don't have to start processing what did she really mean or what is she actually trying to say? I am just very straightforward very direct um, and I love fun so those things seem to work well for most people um, and then I get great feedback and lovely messages from all over the place about you know how much my little messages on the likes of LinkedIn or my YouTube are actually making to people's lives because I do a little bit every day and like that like we were talking earlier a lot of people when they're okay they don't want to understand nor do they think they need to understand but if I do little bite-sized videos every day, they are starting to think about it. And then they'll start to tell me, usually offline. Like, it's, it's amazing on social media. People are actually even afraid to like stuff because what will other people think in their network? <laughs> and that is fear at work. And I used to be one of those. And that's how I know that. But, but how, I, how I love is um, I got into a lift one day in a building where I was working and a guy who I don't know from Adam quoted one of my sayings off my LinkedIn video to me in the lift. And I, I remember being totally like sort of, and it's not like me, <laughs> but I was tongue tied because I was shocked at the detail he had remembered on it. And then, and then other people will tell you when they meet you in a corridor or they meet you somewhere by chance, I love your videos. So they're all watching because I just think, you know, the, the little self-mastery tips, people know they need them because most people struggle day to day. And, and if there's a little bit of positivity there somewhere, that helps them feel better. Like people say things to me like, oh my, like I make videos for people that have sent me messages and I might be walking and I might just do a quick video saying, this is where I am today, blah, blah, blah. And then they'll come straight back to me going, you've just cheered me up for the whole day. So I just think people need positivity more than ever, especially this year. And yet they'll not find it easily. So that's why I think people get me because I'm this little bit of positivity that doesn't seem to care what people think, knows what she's talking about. Um, and I'm helping them little bit by little bit. So yeah, I'm delighted with it. Well, I mean, you, you talked about, I mean, talk to us about your, your sort of your coaching style and your, your mentoring style. What's, yeah well what way do you approach it i would say with my coaching style i am very probably very much like what we were saying there i'm very raw and very authentic and there's no frills with me and i don't do nonsense nor do i do waffle um so i'm very quick to just and i don't judge people i've learned so much about unconscious bias from my work in lean in that i i have now taught myself how not to judge people. And that's what I expect of others. So when I'm coaching someone, I think I'm totally raw, totally authentic. And if, if they don't like raw and authentic and real, then they're not for me. So, and usually that's what happens. So I, I, if somebody's coming looking for coaching, I will have a chat with them and I will tell them exactly what I'm going to do with them. And if it scares them or if, if it sounds like it's too much, and they're not ready for it yet, then that's good because my time is precious and time maximization is something as that we realized that everybody is making the most of their time. 
Um, and yet it can be done if your mindset is right. And if you've done your vision and you've got that legacy in sight and that pull, you will find ways to fit things in. So many people talk themselves out of coaching or doing self-mastery because they don't have time. And yet it's the one thing that will change their lives and all the lives around them, especially if they've little people that they can influence. So um, yeah, time maximization is something I would love people to test themselves on because, and the, and the way to do it is when you get an opportunity to do something that you know is related to the fire in your belly or related to your passion, and yet you say, oh, I haven't time or I can't do it wrong, right? Pause, don't say no, just stop and think of how you will squeeze that in. Because remember we said, if you have fire in your belly, then you're a life. If you don't have fire in your belly, you're not life. So if you're going through the motions for something and an opportunity comes your way and you say, no, I haven't time, just put it on ice. Do the five second rule, which is one that Mel Robbins actually has taught people around the world. She's another brilliant speaker. Um, but five seconds is what I teach a lot of people. You put your thoughts on ice rather than respond because that's what most people will do. And they will go, oh, I can't cope with all of this. It's too much. Wrong. Of course you can cope with it. It's all about mindset. It'll be no bother to you. Give it a lash. It'll be fine. I do that all the time to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I put myself in hot water regularly and it always works. But that's because I've my fears under wraps, you see, and under control. And I've lost a lot of them by now. But yeah, so time maximization, I would challenge people because if I can do motivational talks, a full-time job, three kids, a commute and two bands, then you guys need to find ways of fitting in the fire in your belly stuff no matter how small it is. And it, and it might be very small some days for me. I might only get to do like a five minute chat with someone or a quick DM to coach somebody, but it's still there. So it keeps that fire going for me. So it's just something I want people to take away from this. Talk us about balance. So I don't do balance, I do blend. <laughs> I do coach people saying, if you're trying to find the perfect balance, I don't think it exists. So I think blend is what works. So for example, like my kids know I'm doing a podcast with you today. So they'll know all about it. Now they now know what a podcast is, what mommy is doing. I didn't know any of that when I was a kid, right? So they're learning from me because I have a blend going. And often, like I make TikTok videos um, just to cheer people up and a bit of crack in them. And my kids help me do that. And that is what way it works for me. It's blend. It's my work is mixed up with my kids. My band is mixed up in my work. Um, my lean in work is mixed up in my day job. I have the whole lot intertwined and I can you go from one to the other every day and keep them all moving. And it's, it's doable. Whereas I think many people set them up, themselves up for failure because they're trying to get this balance that they've heard about. Um, and they, they think that they'll go to work, it starts and it stops. And then they switch over into either their own time and you know fitness or if their parents that they go to their kids. And I don't think that really works because when you leave work, quite often you don't stop thinking about work. Um, and when you're in work, you don't quite often stop thinking about what you did when you're out of work. So to take all that pressure away, I decided that balance wasn't working for me because I was trying to do that for a long time. And then I decided to try blend. I read somewhere about a work-life blend. And I said, that's more like me. So now I make like motivational videos in the car on the way to the kids thing or whatever. So I have it all mixed up and it's much easier. I just keep a really good diary. Diary management is very important if you're trying to do that. Um, and, and it's also very important to help you maximize your time. It's, it's great. Uh, I love the way you do that. I mean, are you, are you a big journaler, writer? You know, what way do you sort of get your own process? You know, yeah, and... journaling. Absolutely. Um, and what I tell most people to do is get a few journals going. And they're like, what's a journal? And all a journal is for me is somewhere to write down if I'm having positive emotions or positive learnings or positive experience, 
that goes into one journal. Or if I'm running into a lot of emotional complications, that goes into another journal. So rather than have stuff built up inside me and causing me emotional stress, I journal. And journaling just means writing. It just means that you're taking notes and you're writing down how you feel um, and helping you process it. And my journals are kept on my phone, Pete, because I'm always on the move. I can't have a book somewhere. So for me, and I recommend to many people, because you always have your phone with you everywhere, um, I just do draft emails. Um, one of them is all of my business ideas. So if I'm doing some coaching work with someone and I start to see themes coming through and I think I want to do another video on that, then I'll have that in my business ideas journal. And then I'll have a journal for stuff that's difficult to deal with emotionally. And then I'll have a journal for my um, successes. And that's a very important thing, actually, that we should talk about, because I believe that to make your dreams come true, you have to master a few things. One of them is your fears. Um, the other one is the vision that we talked about. So you have to be clear on where you're going. But the other one is to celebrate your successes. Um, and it's a real agile concept for those into agile project management. But celebrating your successes and your small wins is just as important as the mastering the fears and the vision. So those three things go together. So for anybody who's going to try a bit of self-mastery, write those three things down. Your vision, mastering your fears. Um, and celebrating your wins. So your success journal is very important. I use it a lot. And what, why is that? I mean, is it, a, is it a pride thing or what is it? I actually think it's something that helps people with imposter syndrome as well. So imposter syndrome, for those who have heard of it but aren't sure what it is, is when you go into a room, perhaps, or you go into an area and you feel like you're not good enough to be there or you feel a bit intimidated by the group of people that's already there. That's what they call imposter syndrome. And one of the ways, and, and by the way, most people have experienced that. Um, and even the biggest of celebrities will often admit to feeling imposter syndrome. We all get it. And again, it's that old negative conditioning that's in there that we are swimming against all of the time. But a success journal is very, very handy to deal with it. And a success journal is where you have written down all of the things you've mastered, the things that you're proud that you did in your life. Like for me, it's being an army officer. You know, I never expected I'd end up doing an army officer. For me, it's playing music. Some days it's just that I managed to overcome some big emotional hurdle. So it's anything and everything, but it's very important that it exists. And the reason I'm talking about it with imposter syndrome is if you find yourself in a situation where you are feeling a bit intimidated by others, and it doesn't matter whether that's in school and you're a kid or whether that's in a workplace or whatever it is, bring yourself back to your success journal and remind yourself of who you are. They say she remembered who she was and the game changed. And that is so true. And it goes for guys as well. If you bring yourself back to who you are, what you've done, some of the accomplishments that you have behind you. And they're in your success journal and they'll come to mind quickly if you've been writing them down. That'll bolster you and it'll get you over that ridiculous imposter syndrome or the fear that has hit you temporarily. And it'll give you the belief in yourself again and the worth again and off you'll go. You'll overcome no problem with that. Oh, thank you for that. Why lean in? Well, why not? <laughs> Lean in. I absolutely love the concept. And I have to tell you how I got into it. I was doing a lot of female led networks in corporates because I was trying to get women to empower each other and mentor each other. And they started doing it. And I was so amazed. They were so good at it. They were amazing mentors, but yet I hadn't been mentored by women to then. So I said to myself, right, I need to build this out. I need more people benefiting from this. And I knew because I love my social media that I had seen something around diversity called Lean In. And I went on to Twitter and I found Lean In um, and I found a lady called Nuala Murphy in Belfast who had set up Lean In Northern Ireland. Um, and I said to her, Nuala, I have all of these women who are mentoring each other in work and they're phenomenal. And I want to build it out right across our company that I'm in. And she said to me, Brita, I haven't got a Lean In Ireland going yet. And I was like, oh, 
opportunity knocks. I want to do that. But what we did, because Nuala didn't know me and I didn't know her from Adam, we literally just met on Twitter, which by the way, I meet a lot of people on social media. I, I believe a lot in networking online and I'm not sure that everybody else is doing it and they need to start, but we can come back to that. But Nuala and I were DMing each other on Facebook at three o'clock in the morning feeding our kids. She had a baby son and I had a baby son at the time. And the two wee boys were being fed in each of our kitchens. She was in Belfast, I was in Monaghan. And here we were DMing each other about what we were going to do to help women get empowered. <laughs> and I remember for a split second going, it's a bit mad what we're doing here. This could be something big like, um, and the two of us were as driven as each other. So we, we then pulled a team of women together. We handpicked women, some of them off social media that we knew were good, strong, empowered women that would really help others and inspire others. And we started Lean in Ireland. So yeah, that's how it came about. But what we do is we run events usually. Um, now we're all online and we're making videos for all our network, but it's, it's empowerment type topics. I did one on fear, for example. So we're trying to teach women and men that will get involved with us, which is difficult. We, we struggle to get the guys to come in. But we have some really good supporters, really good male allies. Um, and that's another thing I'm interested in doing is teaching some males how to really support careers for females. Because I think the guys want to, but they don't often know how to. So I'm very interested in trying to give a few male allies some proper tools and techniques that they can use to actually push women and help get some of that diversity of thought at those senior, those senior levels across corporates. Because I think everybody wants it. They just don't know how to get there. No, it's absolutely. I mean, it's the, the empowerment across the board is so, so strong. I want to be respectful of time here. So I'm just conscious. What's, what's a mantra? What do you live by? I have two quotes, I suppose. Um, I have a few actually, but two that I will, will share here because I want others to try them as well. One of them we've already done, be the change you want to see. <clears throat> and what I usually say to people is figure out what's annoying you most. What is frustrating you about the world, about your role, your career, your personal life and become the change that you want to see. Don't wait on someone else to do it. Figure out what needs to be done and start doing it yourself. And that's what I started to do years ago. And the other quote that absolutely changed my life and gave me a lot of headspace back was, what other people think of you is none of your business. And I think that one works particularly well with the Irish because we were told as kids, it's none of your business, right? So we are well trained at it's none of your business. And then when we get the, um, what other people think of you is none of your business. We comply quite easily with that one. And when people get that, and they've practiced that daily and they've, you know, said it out loud enough times and it starts to sink in and become their default thinking, that absolutely takes so much crap thinking out of their, their way. They stop worrying about what everybody's going to think about every little thing they do and they get a lot more free time in their head to get creative, to, you know, come up with ideas. It's absolutely a game changer. And then the other thing, lastly, around mantras is when people describe me, I write it down on my vision board. So I have a number of things written on my vision board because I think words are very powerful. Um, people have called me a firecracker, a breath of fresh air. They call me a bofa, which stands for a breath of fresh air. And they call me energetic. And there's loads of other words. But I just think if somebody gives you a compliment, have somewhere, whether that's a journal or something, you know, in a notepad and write it down because we don't realize, but our mind thinks when we think in ink, our mind can absorb it so much better. Fleeting thoughts are just fleeting thoughts. And if you don't write it down or capture it somewhere, then it could be gone on you. So, and we need every bit we can get of the positivity to undo all the negativity that the, the society gives. <laughs> love, it. love it. Very quickly, what's a guilty pleasure for you? I can't tell you on this. <laughs> I would say my, my guilty pleasure is rave. So I played country music in the show band. I played traditional music. I then joined a rock band 
which I mentioned briefly, to do fundraising gigs. So mm. I play Celtic rock on a piano accordion, but I'm a raver. <laughs> and everybody's a bit like, what? I love rave. I used to go to raves when I was younger. I never did any of the drugs. I didn't need it because <laughs> I, I think it's, it's sedated. I need it. <laughs> but music absolutely can lift my spirits just like that. So in my car, I have rave music going and the kids listen to rave music with me. So <laughs> I do be driving around Monaghan. You can see people kind of going, is that her car? That boom, boom, boom's coming from. Absolutely it is. And I love it. It's mm. brilliant. It's a vibration of the soul really, isn't it? Um, tell us one or two words then. What's your fire in the belly? My fire in the belly is to keep doing what I'm doing, but do more of it um, and do everything where I can spot an opportunity to improve somebody's life because the, the self mastery is life transformation. It's life magic. And I don't think there's anything as special as that. That's not one or two words, but we'll let you away with it. <laughs> <laughs> I should, I should have known rightly. Tell us, I mean, how can people reach out to you, follow you, stalk you, run you down? How can, how can they get out to you? Come and talk to me anywhere I am. I'm everywhere because um, I'm far from shy, as I'm sure you have worked out now. I have a new website. It's breedamckeague.com. So it's B-R-E-D-A-M-C-C-A-G-U-E.com. So go there and there's lots of information there about my talks and bits and pieces of what I do. Plus there's links to my Instagram, my Twitter, my Facebook and my LinkedIn. So that's the places you'll find me. Awesome. I have a funny feeling we could talk for days, but um, I want to be respectful of time. So listen, Brita, it's been an absolute hoot to have you on. So thank you so much. And if you have any closing thoughts for us here, I'd be really appreciative. I just think the next time you're going to talk yourself out of something, use the words, why not? Love it. Thank you. Brita, appreciate it. And we'll talk again soon. Likewise, Pete. Talk soon. Thanks, everybody.